Hawaii. <laughs> Hey there, Plague Von Karma here. Today, we're going over the history of how one chubby bear became one of the most dominant Pokemon ever, Snorlax. Many remember Snorlax as a Gen 1 menace that went on to be crowned as the king of Generation 2. Hell, a minority of Gen 1 fans even think that Snorlax is the best Pokemon in that generation, compared to Taurus. While there are many videos out there explaining what makes it so good in GSC, as well as why we have a bandit, Few can explain how and why Game Freak unleashed this monster. This video will be taking that angle, as there's actually a lot of history to it. How did Snorlax get past the developers, when it's so ridiculously good not only in GSC, but in RBY as well? Before we get to the nitty gritty, the competitive format back in the day was different to what the West is used to, so we should go over some historical context. It was 1997, there was no Smogon, there was no VGC, there were no reliable internet sources to scratch information from. Hell, no resources at all beyond the odd book published by enthusiasts. We didn't even fully know what all that our moves did. Competitively, we had an official format called Nintendo Cup, a format that would change yearly, and one that played an integral role in how Snorlax and the games themselves rose to fame in the first place. So let's explain the rule set. Nintendo Cup 1997 is very similar to the ranked battle formats that have existed in online play since Black and White. The Global Battle Union, Battle Spot, Battle Stadium, and so on. They are all the same thing. You have a team of six Pokemon, but can only bring three via team preview, and the big legendaries are banned. And naturally, your Pokemon can only hold one of each item in later versions. However, there are some caveats that make Nintendo Club 97 dif distinctly different to what we know in Battle Stadium singles. The self ko and sleep clauses also applied, making this the first documented use of those rulings. self ko clause essentially means that if your last Pokemon KOs itself through its explosion or self-destruct, you lose, even if you KO'd the opponent. This is because the mechanic in most Pokemon titles just being run natively. The sleep clause was also slightly different to today, counting self-inflicted sleep to rest, which was also applied natively in Pokemon Stadium and all future Stadium titles. Smogon's version just is just different. Now, one problem being consider is that flat battles didn't exist to level Pokemon down to 50. How did Nintendo handle this one? Well, it was odd. You see, a level range of 50 to 55 was enforced with something I called the level sum limit. You can only bring 3 Pokemon of a total level of up to 155. Thus, beyond 50, you essentially had 5 total levels to give out to your 3 participating Pokemon. This resulted in many unique team compositions like Balance Cruise level 51 to 53, or a few level 55s as beat sticks alongside some speed level 50s, like Dugtrio, Jolteon, or even Electrode. These levels were also valuable for certain Pokemon to get important moves. For example, a Jolteon Zapdos was locked to level 55. As you would expect, Snorlax in its inception was quite common, as it's effectively a legendary Pokemon in its stats and how you encounter it. Surely it's broken, right? It was favoured for its superior bulk, high attack stat, and normal typing. It could also leverage its bulk to set up an amnesia to attack on a special side. Remember, attacks were much weaker and items didn't exist, so its bulk was significantly better than you would expect. Body Slam, a move of 85 base power, was considered to be extremely strong, especially from Stab, also known as State and Time Attack Bonus. And of course, it can use Self-Destruct to take something down with it. Snorlax's strategies weren't like the ones we see in modern RBY. Reflect still hadn't been identified as an amazing option, and wasn't always using Rist either. The most common set was Body Slam, Hyper Beam, Earthquake, and Self Destruct, though in Nintendo Cup, some would use Blizzard to dispatch Rhydon and potentially land a freeze as a bonus. You can see this set a lot across other formats as well, from old sites to even today as the Fizzlax set, though obviously you wouldn't be using Blizzard. While Snorlax was initially pretty decent, strategies diversified while Snorlax didn't. Soon, the Osaka Regional Tournament will be showcased, with Taurus being used in televised games. Weeks later, in August 1997, Miran Fujita brought Taurus to a tournament in Tokyo and destroyed everyone with it, and from there, it exploded in usage, eventually becoming mandatory on most teams. Around the same time, Snorlax's usage just plummeted. While it seems odd in retrospect, the main reason it fell so hard was due to the rules. Nintendo Cup 1997 doesn't ban many things, and as a result it was a fairly explosive format with many ways for your Pokemon to die. Let's go over some of these issues. So, when AKO moves weren't banned. They only affect slower Pokemon Generation 1, but Snorlax was slower than everything. Oko moves were common on most Pokemon that could learn them. For example, Fissure Taurus and Dugtrio were pretty popular. 
The 30% chance to hit wasn't really enough to skew the risk reward factor against the user. You had counterplay in switching against faster Pokemon, or you could use Gengar for Horn Drill and Guillotine, or flying types of Fissure. But again, none of these really helped Snorlax, they just stopped it from setting up. You know, it's really bad. Evasion also works against Snorlax. Uh, they are legal and at their most powerful in Tentacle Knight 7, immediately cutting a 100% hit chance down to 66%, then to 50%, until eventually you're down to a mere quarter. Effectively, you're being lowered by two stages out of the gate compared to later titles. With Snorlax being slower than everything, this is a real issue for it, making any self-destruct attempt to crapshoot. If the opponent lacks a switch in, they can always favourably gamble. Blizzard was also ridiculously powerful, and very, very, very frequently used. In the Japanese games, Blizzard had a 30.1% chance to freeze, essentially making an Oko move in its own right. Remember, you couldn't naturally thaw out of a Gen 1 freeze. A frozen Pokemon could only be thawed through taking a haze or a move that could burn, and well, nothing used these for that very reason. Not to mention Snorlax is hit pretty hard as is, its special isn't that high in Generation 1. Sleep leads were also very common, with Pokemon such as Jinx also having Blizzard. Sleep lasted 1-7 to turns and took a turn to wake up from, while being easier to inflict than freezing. This was usually a free KO, so you're just fighting with a Pokemon down. It got to the point that the saving games lowered sleep to 0-3 to turns, and Freeze Claws was implemented. They were just that strong. While Sleep Claws existed, it isn't as simple as psychic Pokemon to sleep in Gen 1 or U. You only have 3 Pokemon in Tentacle 7, all likely picked with great care to deal with the opposing team. Keep in mind, you're usually switching into a Jinx Blizzard after taking sleep. Snorlax being so slow meant it immediately left your team vulnerable to this terrible position. The level system also worked against Snorlax. Snorlax needed the bulk from extra levels to deal with Pokemon such as level 55 Taurus, which you couldn't always afford as you wanted to use those levels on BDs yourself, like Taurus. Competition for the normal types of the 3v3 format was also very fierce. In a 6v6 format, there is far less risk to picking normal types. However, in a 3v3, type variety becomes more favoured. The fast games, maybe less than 10 turns, make every turn critical and mandate many resistances to minimise damage. Ice types are crucial as they're immune to being frozen, and ground types keep jolty on at bay. With competition like Taurus out there, Fittix Snorlax in becomes so, so, so much harder. As a result of these issues outlined, the meta games shifted significantly past Snorlax, making it very different to your run of the mill RBYOU. Many players prioritise speed as they want to avoid game ending status and Oko moves while investing less in levels. Jinx also quickly cements itself as one of the best Pokemon, its 1 2 punch with Lovely Kiss forcing switches into a Blizzard Freeze. Level syncing Pokemon such as Zapdos also became less popular, though this example is also due to the speed of Jolteon and Electrode freeing up levels, making them better, less costly electro types. So as a result, Snorlax fell off and wasn't really seen again throughout the format. Hell, it didn't even make the top cover in the Space World 97 National Tournament. It was just... bad. There was one further format for Snorlax to try though, with Nintendo Club 1998 allowing only level 30s available in the Japanese stadium titles, including itself. Here, it saw incredibly strong usage thanks to Japanese stadium nerfing much of what hurt the original games. Evasion was nerfed, Blizzard had its 10.1% freeze chance, and Sleep was nerfed to become a coin toss, all of which led to vastly decreased usage of Jinx, no longer being an obnoxious 1-2 punch that punished Snorlax whenever it tried to set up. Instead, Executor took the throne, with Chansey and Starmie being popular as well, all of which weren't too comfortable with paralysis and the power of Snorlax's rampant body slams. It wasn't a tier staple at all, just shy of top 10 on Pokemon Battle Stories documentation, but this was definitely an eye-opening appearance. It also placed once in the top cut of Nintendo 1998 National Tournament on 64 Mario Stadium, being used by Tomoyuki Hori, making it seemingly the first time Snorlax ever topped an event. Its set is also known, using Blizzard, Thunderbolt, Body Slam, and Earthquake. However, modern interpretations of the format seem to believe that an Amnesia set is more effective. There was another Nintendo Cup in 1999, which was effectively the first underused tier, barring all topic Pokemon from a Space World 97 National Tournament, as well as explicitly Snorlax. It seems people think it was for balancing reasons, but looking at the Nintendo Cup 98's National Tournament's top cut, I think its use there may actually be why. You see, out of all Pokemon that topped both events, Snorlax was the only new addition, every other Pokemon had previously topped in 97. This also makes the 99 rule set make sense. If for two years the same Pokemon were topic events, it would respond with an unused tier banning all the top cup Pokemon, right? However, its performance in the subsequent Nintendo Cups seems to be irrelevant to Snorlax's balancing, for reasons I'll outline in a bit, so let's move on. While we won't look extensively at modern Gen 1 Snorlax due to the context of the video, it's an important example of how rule sets can change a Pokemon. 
While utterly terrible in the official beta games at the time, Snorlax is notoriously powerful in Generation 1 overused. It hits top 3 in usage in almost every tournament, often being considered a mandatory pick on serious teams alongside Taurus and Chadsey, forming the lauded Big 3, or 3 normals. Its sets have also changed significantly, with its most common sets nowadays revolving around Reflect, allowing it to play a long game against opposing Snorlax. However, you can also use Amnesia or just an old Fizzlax set if you want to. Indeed, a Pokemon once irrelevant now centralizes games to the point that its most consistent counter is itself. Snorlax in these two formats is like night and day. Because Snorlax has had such a middling competitive reception, however, the developers must have sat there scratching their heads wondering how it flopped. After all, like Executor, it has clearly inflated stats and was among the favourites among the developers, and seemed poised to succeed. Well, we have some further insight into what happened, so let's have a look. Thanks to online leaks in recent years, we have access to much of the developer assets for Pokemon Gold and Silver. The Space World 97 demo was leaked online in 2018, and more recently, debug ROMs and even source code were as well. While I won't go into detail about why or how this happened, nor endorse the circumstances, there are some interesting pieces of history regarding Snorlax that we now know about. As you would expect from information at the time, Snorlax was only buffed, as the developers only had its local reception in Integral 97 to initially draw conclusions. What they knew is that it was slow, and having to take a hit before striking back wasn't conducive to a good Pokemon. But they can't just completely relook the stats. Even today, Mantine is the closest example of what, of what we have with something that drastic, so they had to look at the strategy and improve what's there. Given their splitting the special stats, well, there's a golden opportunity. By the time the Space World 97 demo was shown off at its namesake event, Snorlax had received a plus 35 stat buff to special defense as a result of the splitting of the special stats, making it 100. This was at the same event that the 97 National Tournament was held. Code 99, however, even after received a single top placement at the 1998 event, Snorlax would be buffed further to have, uh, have 110 special defense. This would remain until Golden Silver's release and is where Snorlax stands today. In the source code leaks, developer correspondence emails were also found. Beta testers at Super Mario Club would complain to Game Freak about the sheer power of Snorlax during development, comparing its power level to Ho-Oh and Lugia. They would cite their then ridiculously broken belly drum as well as the reasons, due to only halving the Pokemon's current HP, rather than dealing damage equal to half of its max HP. Therefore, at half HP, belly drum would still work, it will just deal a quarter, so it's basically just super fanging yourself. Koji Yoshino, the very person on whom Snorlax was based, would come to its defense. He would cite Snorlax's defense and speed stats as a balancing factor, as well as the risks of using belly drum in general. However, he did change belly drum as a result of his email due to that aforementioned bug. Despite this report, however, another bug exists in the final game where a failed belly drum would still raise the Pokemon's attack by two stages. Hmm. Anyway, how correct was Koji Nishido's defense of Snorlax? Oh, how wrong this man was. Oh, it's just really hard to put into words. So let's get the so-called defensive weakness of Snorlax out of the way. The defense stat is actually quite good due to its massive HP, with Snorlax taking hits akin to those with base 100 defense and HP, like Mew and Celebi, because of it. In fact, Machamp's Cross Chop, the strongest unboosting fighting move in the game, is only a 2 hit KO on Snorlax. Therefore, if Machamp boosts with Curse, it is a highly probable 1 hit KO, and critical hits will do the job as well. Tyranitar, which sometimes carries Dynamic Punch just for a shot of beating Snorlax, only 3 hit KOs it. For a super effective fighting move to even hope to 1-hit KO Snorlax, it needs a boost or a critical hit. The sheer bulk of Snorlax cannot be understated. Keep in mind, the boosting exception applies in reverse. Snorlax can also boost out of KO range with its own curse, and retaliate fiercely with its deadly double edge. Now consider this alongside fighting moves pre-generation 3 being notoriously poor for their accuracy. Cross Chop is 80% accuracy, and Dynamic Punch is 50%. Your Machamp could be poised to swing for the KO, only to miss, watch Slox pick up a curse boost, and suddenly the game is out of your control and out of any and all theory. Evil. Pure evil. It's very important to remember that, compared to today's Pokemon and meta games, there are comparatively few ways to boost the Pokemon's damage outside of boosting moves such as Curse and Sword Stance. Items such as Choice Span, Choice Specs, and Life Orb hadn't been invented yet. You really didn't have much to scratch a big, big bulk monster like Snorlax. The items that did boost your power, the elemental type boosting items such as Charcoal, only offer a 10% boost instead of the 20% increase they currently do. As a result, most Pokemon carry leftovers, with very few exceptions, such as Charcoal and Moltres. Due to the way stats experience worked in the first two generations, allowing a Pokemon to maximize all of their stats, and fewer fighting type moves that would be desired, 
Snorlax's only type weakness was an effective non-issue, outside of niche matchups. Said matchups, Machamp and Randy Dynamic Output choosers, were a headache for the Big Bear, but these changes made Snorlax significantly harder to break than it is now. You were drastically more rewarded for having defensive stats in these games, making head-on interactions feel a bit more realistic, honestly. I do kind of like it. So, now we know what direct changes were made to Snorlax, and some of the general environment. However, what else changed around in Gen 2? A lot, actually. For starters, the special stat split made many old special attackers worse. Alakazam and the Executor were made easier to KO on the special side, while Chansey, well, Blissey now, almost completely lost its offensive presence. Tauros, Snorlax's strongest competition as a normal type of Generation 1, was also significantly nerfed, with a decent special stat of 17 going into special defense, and its special attack became a pathetic base 40 after a string of nerfs during development. While still a decent Pokémon, the King of Generation 1 was much weaker overall, being replaced with superior attackers in high-level play. So, when we look at Snorlax's ridiculous special defense increase, it wasn't just a buff, it was how Slugs was among the game's biggest winners in this deep mechanics change. In addition, being frozen was now of non-permanent status. Pokemon would now have a 10% chance to thaw out every turn. Another way to get past Slugs' bulk was mostly off the table. The nerf matters less in fast-paced in Telecom 2000, but only because other nerfs made freeze less common. Blizzard, the most notorious cause of freezing, also received a hefty string of nerfs over time. During the localization of Red and Blue, its high freeze strats was reduced from 30.1% to 10%, and Generation 2, they also reduced the accuracy from 90% to 70%. As a result, freezing has since become a relatively rare occurrence, with Ice Beam spam being the main method of trying to make it happen. In short, not only is freezing Snorlax less effective, it's way harder to do compared to the original games. Pokémon could also now attack on the turn sleep ends, and sleep's maximum turns were reduced to 6. And all the this is, it's not the most famous sleep change. Because, well, all stats has got indirectly nerfed with the new improved rest. It probably healed stat drops from murder paralysis, but the addition of Sleep Talk was the biggest game changer. Aside from Sleep Talk letting resting Pokemon actually move, Dredger 2's Sleep Talk calling rest would have failed the user to take any amount of damage. It would set Sleep Talk to burn to 2 as it's appropriate for rest, and then, and this is a kicker, rest would still replenish all of your health as if you had just started it. This made Rest Talk a very consistent set that many Pokemon could run successfully, as all but a few specific Pokemon such as Unknown could learn them both. However, Sleep Talk's attack calls are random, so a frail Pokemon could get wiped out if luck wasn't on its side. Therefore, you had to be bulky to use it successfully. And in the Big Bear's case, it just so happened to have the perfect levels of bulk to use it properly. Rest was a big part of what made Slork so successful, and with Sleep Talk in hand, it soon became very, very powerful. It was also pretty big for the Nintendo Cup meta game, as self-inflicted sleep counted under Sleep Talk, which is why, well, we'll get to that in a minute, actually. Heal Bell's addition to the game also made being frozen or asleep even less of a problem for Snorlax. Pokemon such as Miltak or Blissey could be used alongside it to make using rest and switching out much less of an issue. Players could effectively block sleep in the Nintendo Cup and recover it at any time. Generally, this is a great position to be in. The addition of items bestows Snorlax with the one it's used ever since, Leftovers. This item restores 1 16th of the Pokemon's health every turn, which means Snorlax recovers around 32 HP at a time thanks to its Titanic HP stat. That's 4 turns to make a seismic toss meaningless. This helps greatly with keeping Snorlax out of KO range, with many guaranteed 3 KOs or 4 KOs becoming uncertain. Virtually every Pokemon runs leftovers in Smogos Gen 2 OU meta game purely for this quality, but it's indisputable to claim Snorlax was among the biggest beneficiaries. As a result, even in the item clause meta game of Nintendo 2000, 22 years ago, you know who's being given this coerced item. I mean, it even comes with it. It's common to see players taking advantage of things like predicted double switches, rest turns, or anything considered free for just an ounce of leftovers recovery on their Snorlax. It should be noted that, in the 97 demo, leftovers actually recovered 30 HP per turn. So, Snorlax got buffed again. <laughs> As if this wasn't enough, while Reflect was reworked to be a 5 turn double defense stat for the team, indirectly nerfing the modern Gen 1 for Black Snorlax build, Another move that basically any Pokemon could learn was added. Curse. Any Pokemon that wasn't a ghost type could drop its speed by one stage to increase both attack and defense. This was a big step up for Reflect, with a single boost making it a wrecking ball that's extremely hard to KO. Because Snorlax's speed stat was already among the lowest in the game, and defense was its closest thing to a defensive weak point, Snorlax was practically the perfect Pokemon to use this new move to the fullest. Many Snorlax users pair Rest Talk with Curse to buff stats while attacking, pledging held with leftovers and rest pretty safely once set up. Along with Double Edge, this became the traditional curse-like set. However, this has since diversified quite a bit, 
but some like sometimes foregoing Sleep Talk for other options such as Earthquake to not be warped by Ghost types, Flamethrower or Fire Blast to switch Sporatris, Thunder to fry Cloyster, and more. However, Sleep Talk remains a viable option. Slark is extremely flexible. We'll get into that in a minute. The nerfing of critical hits also added to Slark's consistency as a bulky threat. No longer did Slark fear Pokémon such as Tauros, Alexam, and others constantly fishing for critical hits, often at rates of north of like 20% to break through it while it rests. The chance now being standardised and at a lower number allowed for Slark to sort of stand in their way with confidence. To say there weren't any hits would be a major lie though. In Gen 1, Pokémon of the same type of an attack hitting it were immune to major status effects coming from that attack. Applying this, Snorlax cannot be paralyzed by Body Slam in Generation 1, which is what allowed it to switch in with such little risk. While this move became less relevant in Generation 2 due to the addition of Steel types, losing its protection was a relevant change to Snorlax's game plan. Now, switching it on Body Slam and taking on Lucky Paralysis would force a much earlier rest. However, this buffed Snorlax's Body Slam 2. Notably, Double Edge's buff to 120 base power, as well as the addition of Return, meant most of the normal types were using those instead. In fact, Snorlax was one of the few to use Body Slam well despite the relative power drop, since others were too weak for Body Slam in the recovery filled metagame. Now, Snorlax could paralyze Tauros, Miltang, Blissey, and opposing Snorlax with its own Body Slam, and now get it for a chance to bustle past them all on its own. All in all, this mechanic change could be seen as a redefining of how it plays more than anything. More annoyingly, Steel types finally meant something could defensively answer Snorlax. New threats such as Skarmory and Steelix arrived to stand in its way, resisting its powerful double edges. They also had access to Whirlwind and Roar, respectively, which now had used in Generation 2, challenging the Behemoth's trade bark curse like set by forcing it to switch into a random Pokemon. Other normal resistant Roar users also came to the forefront, such as Tyranitar, Rhydon, and Golem. These Pokemon and moves are pivotal in preventing Snorlax from just mowing away the team down, though all but Skarmory could still be severely hurt by Earthquake, and Skarmory could be struck down by Flamethrower and Thunder. Generation 2 also added entry hazards in the form of Spikes. Every time a grounded Pokeball switches in while these caltrop looking things are up, 12.5% of her HP will immediately be lost. Coupled with poison, damage can rack up quite quickly, which greatly cuts into Slark's longevity. If leftovers were removed through Thief, this makes Slark's notably easier to wear down and eventually KO. Some teams opted for Pokemon such as Foratress, Golem, or Cloyster to remove spikes through Rapid Spin due to this threat, though it isn't entirely mandatory depending on your team's composition. Overall, Slark's most significant weaknesses in Detective Night 7 were completely erased. It is no longer vulnerable to being frozen, and sleep gets become a much, much weaker status. Access to a buffed rest, sleep talk, and leftovers lets it maintain its threatening presence for longer, even when being put out of commission. Its special bulk is now absolutely monstrous, with the physical bulk being easily patched up by a curse, which doubles as a win condition. It wasn't foolproof, but undeniably got buffed a needless amount. <laughs> so, considering all of this, how does Slark's fare in Nintendo Cup 2000, the premier Generation 2 format for the generation? Well, to put it simply, it was considered to be the single best Pokemon in the entire format, arguably of all time. It's its SSS tier on the Pokemon Battle Historia viability rankings. It was literally in its own tier. Slorx was so ridiculously broken that it could easily just win games on its own. The new special defense stats, Sleep Talk and Curse, all paved the way for the creation of a terrifying unnatural force that will deal monumental damage while being seemingly incapable of fainting. It was well worth risking Oko moves for this beast. Many teams will carry multiple checks just to beat it. Which, well, you probably do get a Generation 2 for that, but you know, it's a thing. But what about Slark's Generation 2 overused? The first sentence of a smog analysis quite literally says, Behold, the single most dominant Pokemon in any OU tier in history. Absolutely no OU Pokemon history comes even remotely close to the sheer power and dominance of Snorlax in Generation 2. It consistently hits 100% usage in every high level GSC tournament. It is very, very uncommon to see a team without this big beast, and not using it is often considered to be a handicap or even self-sabotage. There is almost no reason to ever not use Snorlax in Generation 2 in standard play. Even during its dominance in Integral 2000, Game Freak would go on to buff Snorlax again after the game came out in the United States, giving it lovely kiss via an event in New York, and I'll get to put non-Rest Talk sets out of commission. This adds to Snorlax's already incredible versatility. Early game or late game, lovely kiss Snorlax was a big deal, especially with a pursuit user like Tyranitar or Umbreon at the back. Just another Tuesday for Generation 2 Snorlax. So how the hell do you beat this thing? 
Spikes are arguably the most important, and for good reason. They deal 12.5% of the time, which requires two turns of leftovers to compensate for. This is crucial in preventing Snorlax from recovering constantly, and thus, many teams will have a Pokemon that can set it, like Cloyster, which doubles as an explosion user that can stop stuck a couple of unboosted blows from Snorlax. Teams featuring Gengar or Mischievous particularly enjoy blocking Rapid Spin from Pokemon like Fortress, Cloyster, and Golem, albeit with extreme anxiety in Gengar's case every single time. As GSC's better game has progressed, spikes have only become more important and common. You should really be putting them on most of your teams. It usually takes an explosion to take Snorlax down reliably in a big blow, with popular Pokemon such as Golem, Executor, Steelix, and Cloyster all being popular choices. It takes little prior damage before an explosion because of relevant threat to Snorlax's survival. However, predicting explosions is a fairly common dynamic in Generation 2 gameplay, with resists often switching in if they see one coming. On top of this, leftovers, combined with Snorlax's high HP, could often just barely bring it outside of KO with hit range. And of course, the inherent risks outside of its supply. If you don't hit your target, or the follow-up goes wrong, you've just wasted an entire Pokemon. Roar and Whirlwind are often used to force Snorlax to set up again later, with Scarberry and Steelix being particularly good users of the moves. This also allows damage from spikes to rack up, maintaining solid momentum. Now, these do need to be normal resists, as otherwise Snorlax are just part ways of hefty double edge before they get a chance. Both moves have negative priority as always. Outside of Steel types mentioned before, Rock types in Rhydon, Golem, and Tyranitar can wall Earthquakeless sets while using Roar to force it out, with Tyranitar being particularly proficient thanks to its massive bulk itself. They're also good at frustrating unboosted Snorlax and Rock-type flinches, which can be quite useful as it's paralyzed. Ghost types remain good at Snorlax as as well, with Gengar remaining to end all counters of Snorlax sets using only normal moves. Being weak to Earthquake means it's often taking it, with a Skarmory in tow, this combination can completely shut off some Snorlax sets. Some players use Char, Miltank, or Umbreon to try and prevent the cursed setup, being able to PP store easily thanks to their massive, well, PP. This forces out in a rather unorthodox fashion, but it is very effective. However, these Pokemon lose badly to the rare Belly Drum Snorlax set, which will just mow them down and subsequently the rest of the present place team. Another fair option is Perish Trapping with Mischievous, which is another Ghost type answer. This is done by using Mean Luck to lock it in, and then store it with Perish Song. Even a plus one Earthquake from Snorlax can't do a KO Mischievous reliably, though with enough boosts, Snorlax may wrestle its way out, and if it really, 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 really wants to, it can use Shadow Ball, I guess. You know, you can use it. Mischievous is among the more consistent ways to evolve your Snorlax, though there are many other options, so let's continue. When Snorlax is in a passive state, such as when it's resting, fishing for critical hits can work with Machamp's Cross Chop, which can randomly Oko Snorlax regardless of the boost it has. It's even a 2 a without a critical hit if Snorlax hasn't got its boost yet. This can really scare Snorlax, forcing it out if Machamp comes in a predicted rest. However, if Snorlax is already boosted, fishing can be a very high risk endeavor. Likewise, Marowak and Heracross can also use their sheer physical attacking prowess to try and beat Snorlax before it wakes up, though they are nowhere near as consistent. Even a Swords Dance boosted Earthquake from Thick Club Marowak, one of the most powerful attacks of the game period, only has a 50% chance to Oko to unboost the Snorlax. Not to mention all of these Pokemon need to actually switch in, as Snorlax is anything but passive, or could even just get a Curse Boost. Remember, it's Double Edge is a massive threat, so many potential Oko and two Kos can change dramatically after a Curse, and it still becomes more threatening from that. Even one Curse Boost is enough for Snorlax to begin bowling over teams to pay all its coverage. Again, trying to outgun Snorlax doesn't work, you need to hit it when it's passive, or already limping. Outside of these options, you're likely going to have to use multiple Pokemon, such as Scarborough and Umbreon, in a concentrated effort to ward it out. It's common to see Pokemon on offensive teams using Thief to remove Snorlax's leftovers, often with Toxic and Spikes in, in tow, so it reduces longevity significantly. This forces it to use Rest more often, leaving it vulnerable to exploitation. Once you're cleaved open, however, you're in for a ride. And of course, Snorlax's versatility could make many of these options just completely dead. Even checking Snorlax is a dangerous game to play, especially when not knowing the set, and if so, Beast Overlord will make sure you know that. So, let's look at its versatility. It mainly comes from its Generation 1 appearance, where normal types were often given extremely diverse move pools. So far, we haven't actually gone over the sets it actually uses in detail. Popular past gen player PKC puts it best. You can run almost any combination of moves on Snorlax, and this big guy will make that work. I recommend watching his video on Slox and Jerry's 2 OU metagame, which I'll link right here. However, I'll sum up the important bits for you. As a rule of thumb, Slox tends to run with Rest or Self Destruct, and then three moves. However, there are exceptions to this, and sometimes both can be seen together. Self Destruct has effectively 600 base power, factoring same type attack bonus, as innate ability to half defense during damage calculation. Some players will use their Slox to clean up the game and hold the opposing team with a near guaranteed KO instead of playing a long game. This often makes, like, Thunder Zapdos extremely powerful. Double Edge is the main stab for its immense power, 
but Bondi Slab and Return often see use for the Paralysis Chance and pa uh, Power Points for well, Snow Recoil, respectively. Any of these can be used alongside Earthquake to hit every Pokémon for at least neutral damage, except maybe Scarberry and Aerodactyl. In this case, Thunder solves the problem by lowering Cloyster. While Slark enjoys using Curse to boost, it isn't its only option. Belly Drum can be used to muscle past the Growl and Charm users that try to stall, stall out Curse's Power Points, wherein the player is in a game-winning position. It's not uncommon to see Slarks use Flamethrower or Fire Blast for the Steel types trying to wall its beast out, such as Steelix, Fortress, and Scarberry. Fire Blast specifically is used to KO Scarberry. Should rocks types such as Tyranitar, Rhydon, or Golem be a problem, Slarx will sometimes use Surf instead, which still hits Steelix conveniently. Slarx is very capable of using Lovely Kiss to take something out of commission, then abuse the rest of his kit to gain an advantage. Be it Belly Drum, Curse, or General all attacking, there's a lot Slarx can do once it puts me to sleep. Should Lovely Kiss be unnecessary, it's not like Slarx can't use Toxic either. This deals a ton of chip damage while the factory spikes damage as well, with Pokemon taking substantial damage upon switching in. It's also useful for forcing out opposing non-rest Snorlax long term. Snorlax's dominance over the years has led to it to be referred to as, quite literally, one of the most powerful Pokemon ever conceived. While this has become less dominant with the addition of new Pokemon and mechanical changes over the years, almost nothing can match Snorlax's sheer strength and influence in Generation 2 at the time. Snorlax has had a formidable effect on Pokemon design and balance as a whole. You can see similarly lopsided stats in later generations, and those for example the design of Deoxys. Depending on what form you use, Deoxys will specialise in specific stats in a very extreme way. For example, when going into the attack form, Deoxys will drop all defences in favour of extremely high speed and defensive stats, and so on. Generation 3 went on to introduce many strong fighter type moves, most notably Focus Punch, which went on to define offensive competitive play, and with it being consistent fighter type move, you could argue it was targeted squarely at Snorlax. With the addition of additional spikes layers and permanent weather from Tyranitar Sandstream, these can be seen as ways that, that Game Freak further chipped away at bulky Pokemon. If a team likes Tyranitar in Generation 3, they need a serious game plan for late game Snorlax, it's still extremely strong. The removal of stat experience to max all stats could also be seen as answering the sheer ridiculousness of Snorlax's bulk, as well as preventing it from using moves like Flamethrower well to force its way past steel type checks like Skarmory. Plus, the addition of abilities helped Gengar quite a lot, because now it can check non Shadow Ball variants consistently. Hell, you could even see the nerf to explosion moves in Generation 5 as something Snorlax partially contributed to over the years having been among the most strongest users consistently for many generations, because it's self-destruct. Game Freak's shift to focus on double battles in official formats after Generation 2 could also be attributed to Snorlax's tendency to drag games on in Telecom 2000. There were the 64 Mario Stadium episodes where they breached schedule and had to cancel matches. Sleep Talk, one of the most popular moves in GSC, has since been nerfed considerably. No longer can rest be called to reset the loop, and this put a serious dent in Snorlax's long-term game plan in tandem with chip damage from Hazards of Weather. In Generation 3, swapping out after Sleep Talk would have reset the sleep turns, keeping Snorlax asleep, forcing more careful Sleep Talk uses, and keeping it off rest for longer periods of time. It's interesting to note that in Stadium 2, despite fixing many GSC mechanics, kept Sleep Talk the same as in the base games, calling rest at all. Was that intended? Even today, Snorlax tends to be a big threat in whatever meta game it ends up in. Hell, in Generation 3 overuse, Snorlax is still considered to be a strong tier staple, either a Pokemon with teams built around it, or a flawed albeit necessary support pick. Additionally, in doubles, almost none of the balancing changes mentioned actually affect it. Hazard damage is significantly less relevant, allowing Slox's belly drum sets to see frequent uses on Trick Room teams. In fact, in Generation 4, it won back to back VGC World events in 2008 and 2009 on, well, Trick Room teams, as it achieved numerous top cut finishes at Worlds 2018 as well. In that same year, it was even banned from Smogon's doubles overuse meta game for the combination of Gluttony, Recycle, and Pinch Recovery berries, which further bolsters Drumlax's potential. In reality, it was not stat creep or being outclassed that actually brought Slax down. It simply became outdated from a singles perspective. I feel like this is a very important distinction to make. Out of every normal type in the game to this day, is there one that actually outclasses Snorlax? Blissey? Porygon 2? Obstagoon? Beware? No, 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 not at all. None of these are really like Snorlax, are they? They are certainly more suitable for singles, either because of their better longevity or quicker setup ability, but they cannot really replicate its role. In doubles, Slarks works better than all of them because there is less potential to be punished for Belladrum usage. No entry hazards are to be found either, and Trick Room is far easier to set it up. Doubles it can really be seen as its new home, and any player venturing into the regional deck spots with VGC immediately have to prepare for Slarks. It can get out of hand very quickly. While it's definitely full of singles relevance, sometimes someone will leave you a grim reminder as to why they called this beast the King of Generation 2. Maybe give GSC a try and see what it can do, eh? Or alternatively, join a Discord server and learn more. 
The modern overused metagame is seen as a shining example of what some good old Pokemon looks like. This was Playful Carver, and I'll see you all next time.